Cancer is a horrible disease, but at least today we have treatments and for a few kinds of cancers we even have cures. And the reason we have them is because the history of science is full of heroes. And this is the story of five of those heroes. Five people who decided to research cancer, to try to find a cure for cancer back when there were no cures nor treatments back when no one knew how to help people who had cancer. This is the story of the first two people who were ever cured of cancer. Our story begins in the 1940s with Sidney Farber. Sidney Farber was a pediatrician, a doctor that had decided to try to save children's lives. And just so that you get an, an impression of what kind of doctor he was, let me tell you that he literally wrote the book about doing autopsies in children, which is a very sad thing to think about, but someone has to do it. And Sidney Farber was not just the kind of man to do it, but to write a book about it. Sidney Farber worked at the Boston's Children's Hospital, and they had a lot of patients who had leukemia. Now, back then, people didn't really understand what leukemia was. All Farber knew is that it was an illness of the blood, and so he thought that it could be similar to anemia. Anemia is an illness of the blood that happens when you lack either iron or folic acid. Now, he knew that his patients did not have deficiencies of iron, but he suspected that they might have deficiencies of folic acid. So he decided to inject them with folic acid, expecting them to get better. But instead, something really weird happened. All his patients started getting more sick. Sidney was very confused, but he reasoned in the following way. Well, if my patients are getting sicker when I give them folic acid, then maybe they will get healthier if I deprive them from folic acid. So Sidney went with his good friend Jalaparagada Subarao, an Indian doctor who is a hero of medicine in his own right. Sidney told him what he had learned about the connection between folic acid and leukemia, and Jalapragada had an idea. Maybe they couldn't stop their patients from making folic acid, but maybe he could create a substance that would bind to folic acid, neutralizing it, so that the cells of the patients would not be able to absorb it. Jalapragada worked late at night in his lab, making many different substances he thought could work and he sent them to Sidney Farber. Sidney Farber tested them in his lab until they found one substance that seemed to work as they wanted, aminopterin. Sidney Farber started giving his patients aminopterin and it was a miracle. All of a sudden, all of these children with leukemia were not tired anymore. All of a the sudden, they had appetite, they were not dizzy, they could stand up and run and play and go to school. They were cured. Sidney Farber must have been so happy he had cured leukemia, he had found a cure for cancer. But then one of the children came back, he had symptoms again. Sidney didn't worry too much, they just restarted the aminopterin treatment. But then another children came back, and then another, and then another. Eventually all the children came back with symptoms. Sidney Farber restarted the aminopterin treatments and they worked. But every time the children would get better for a shorter time until they would not get better at all. And eventually all the children died. It must have been devastating. It must have been heartbreaking to think that he had done it, that he had saved all those children's lives only to be wrong. But he had to remember that he had not entirely failed. The children did get better at least for a little while. Then Sidney Farber did what had to be done and he made autopsies in all of his patients. Remember that he had literally written a book about it. And he found something interesting. The bone marrow in all of these children was corrupted. And this corrupted bone marrow was producing corrupted blood cells. And this is what was killing his patients. Now he could finally understand why aminopterin was working. By depriving the cells from folic acid, aminopterin was basically starving them to death. The problem was that aminopterin was starving both corrupted cells and healthy ones. 
And this meant that in order for aminopterin to be an effective treatment, it had to starve the body until all the corrupted cells were dead and then hope that enough healthy cells had survived to repopulate the bone marrow. This was a very crazy idea, but it was literally their only shot, so they had to keep researching it. The problem was that they had no budget for this, because back then cancer wasn't a really well-known disease. So Sydney decided to change that. Sydney wanted people to know what they were up against. And from all of his patients, there was only one that was healthy enough to give an interview. They nicknamed him Jimmy to protect his identity, and they found out that he really liked baseball. So the people from the radio came to interview him and they brought his favorite team. It's, it's really cool. You can actually watch the original interview in YouTube. It's really heartwarming. And this created the Jimmy Fund that still exists today. In fact, donate to it. I'm going to put the link in the description. But the important thing here is that they got enough money to continue the research. And Sidney Farber started keeping track of how long all the remissions lasted. The longest one they had ever seen was one year. And so he would see the children advance in time, counting the days until it, they got to the longest possible remission, waiting just for them to come back to the hospital and die. But one of the patients got to one year in remission. And then one year and one day, one year and two days, one year and one month, one year and two months, two years. Eventually it became clear that this child was never coming back. And as luck would have it, it was the same child they had interviewed for, for the radio. His name was Einar Gustafsson. And he became, as far as we know, the first person ever to be cured of cancer. It was an incredible achievement. This illness had never been cured before. And yet, they had done it. It was proof. It was proof that it could be done. It was proof that chemotherapy could work. Sidney Farber continued his research with aminopterin and with other substances, and he managed to cure several more patients. But all of them were children. Sidney knew that if he wanted chemotherapy to be a more effective treatment and to be able to help people with many different kinds of cancer, he would need more people to research it as well. Luckily, his call was heard by Jane and Louise Wright. Jane Wright was a doctor, and she came from a very interesting family. Her grandfather had been a slave, who, when he became free, studied medicine and became a doctor. Her stepfather was the first black man to graduate from Yale Medical College, and her biological father was one of the first men to graduate from Harvard Medical Co College. And she herself graduated with honors from New York Medical School. So yeah, they were a very impressive family. Jane and her father Louis heard about chemotherapy, and they were inspired by Sydney, and they began looking for some substance that could kill one specific kind of cell, bone marrow cells. At this point, I should mention that there was a very curious syndrome going on with some veterans of the First World War. You see, many veterans had anemia, but it was not the kind of anemia that could be cured with iron or folic acid. And as these veterans started to die, and people began doing autopsies in them, they found that some of their bones were empty. There was no traces of bone marrow at all. And the only thing all of these veterans had in common was that they all had been exposed to mustard gas. Mustard gas is a horrible substance. It burns your eyes, it blisters your skin, it burns to breathe, and when it gets in your blood, it destroys your bone marrow but it only destroys your bone marrow. Once it's in your blood, it doesn't attack any other organs, which meant that it could be used to treat people with leukemia. As you can imagine, this was a very crazy idea, because Jane and Louis Wright were basically proposing injecting children with mustard gas, a chemical weapon banned by the United Nations. To propose something like this, you need the two things the passion to help your patients, and the confidence in your science that it would indeed help them. But that's exactly what Jane and Louis had. Jane and Louis Wright began researching mustard gas, 
and they managed to develop methotrexate, a substance that was much less dangerous than mustard gas, but still had the same properties of destroying bone marrow. And then they went on to prove that methotrexate could be used to treat different kinds of cancer, and they began researching how to use it in combination with other substances, in what order, in what proportions, and in this way they greatly improved the perception of chemotherapy, so that many other people in the medical community realized its big potential. And so Sydney had forged a weapon, Jane and Lewis Wright had improved it, all they needed was a new hero to wield it and finally kill the beast. And his name was Min Chiu Li. Min Chiu Li was born in China in very difficult times, but somehow through the Chinese Revolution and the Second World War, Li managed to study medicine, become a doctor, and he even participated in some early cancer research. They had heard of this new treatment called chemotherapy, and they tried to replicate the results, although they were unable to do so. Eventually, the Korean War started, and Lee decided that he did not want any more wars in his life, and so he went to the United States, where he got a job at Bethesda Naval Hospital. One day he had a patient, a woman. She had recently had a miscarriage, and she was having some internal bleeding, which was normal in this kind of case. And so he didn't worry too much, but three hours later, that woman was dead. Turns out that she had cancer, specifically she had choriocarcinoma, cancer of the placenta. This was the reason she had had a miscarriage, and now that cancer had metastasized to her lungs, so she basically drowned in her own blood. Lee was devastated. This woman had trusted him, and he had failed her and so he swore that he would never fail another patient like that ever again. And he had a chance to prove himself just a couple of months later, when he had another woman with an almost identical case. She had recently had a miscarriage and she was bleeding internally. Lee immediately ordered some x-rays of her lungs and they found it. She had choriocarcinoma that had metastasized to her lungs. She was losing a lot of blood very quickly. So what Lee decided to do was to extract the blood from her lungs and put it inside her again, which was crazy, but it worked. Now she was stable, although barely, and Lee had decided that she would not die of choriocarcinoma. Lee remembered the cancer research he had done in China about chemotherapy, and he thought that maybe it could help in this case as well. And so they started giving her chemotherapy, and the results were amazing. They could see in the x-ray how the tumors were shrinking and they were vanishing. Everyone was very happy, but none mean Chu Li. He was not taking any chances, so he ordered all the tests and analyzed everything very carefully, and he found something strange. There was a weird hormone in the blood of his patient. He reasoned that since cancer cells are corrupted normal cells, they were producing corrupted versions of normal hormones. But this was great, because this meant that by tracking the amount of this hormone in the blood, he could track the amount of cancer in his patient. One day, they took an x-ray of the patient, and they could not find any traces of cancer left in her, and they were ready to discharge her from the hospital. But Min was not ready, because he could still see some of that weird hormone in her blood, which to him meant that she still must have cancer somewhere in her body, even if it was too small to appear in x-rays. He wanted to continue the chemotherapy treatment, but the hospital directives did not want it. Chemotherapy is a very aggressive treatment, so giving it to a healthy person is very unethical and they ordered Min Chiu Li to stop the treatment immediately. But Li had sworn that this patient would not die of choriocarcinoma, and he could not go back on his promise, so he continued the treatment in secret, until he could no longer find any traces of that hormone left in her blood. In this way, Ethel Longoria became, as far as we know, the first adult ever to be cured of cancer, and the first human to be cured of metastatic cancer. 
Sadly, when the hospital directives found out what Lee had done, they fired him. And Lee was very sad. His friends tried to cheer him up, but he was unconsolable. He had done what had to be done to save Ethel Longoria's life. Meanwhile, Bethesda Hospital became famous as the only place that could cure choriocarcinoma. And so all the people in the United States who had it went to Bethesda Hospital, where they were treated as the hospital directives thought they should be treated, until there were no visible traces of cancer left in them. But a couple of months later, one of the women came back, and then another, and then another. Just as with Sydney's children, they all had cancer again. At this point, the hospital directives realized that Lee was right. They had to continue the treatment even if there were no visible signs of cancer. They tried to apologize to him and they tried to hire him again, but it was too late. Lee had already gotten another research position where he would continue researching cancer. And in fact, all of them did. Sidney Farber, Jala Pragada, the Wrights, all of them continued working and continued making contributions to the defeat of cancer. And, you know, all of this makes me, makes me think about that scene in The Lord of the Rings when Sam asks Frodo if the great stories ever end. And Frodo replies that they don't, that we are all just characters, we do our part, and that's it. And, and I hope that one day in this story we will be able to see the names of Einar Gustafsson and Ethel Longoria and put a third name next to them the name of the last person who died of cancer. Thanks a lot for watching. This video was heavily inspired by The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. This is an amazing book. It's full of science and it's full of hope. Here you can read about Sidney Farber, Minchuli, and many other heroes of science. It's, it's a really good book. Read it. And if you want to know some other stories about the, the, the defeat of cancer, why don't watch this video about imatinib, a drug that pretty much cured one kind of leukemia.